and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you, Marcin Jakubowski. We talked about production technology, uh, our president, uh, Mr. Seidel, talked about it and uh, the role of the production technology for the industry and uh, for the profit of industrial companies. This is the main focus which we have when we are, when we are doing our research work, when we are acquiring projects and the funding for projects. But there is another side for our work which we have to see. And this is uh, the mankind. Technology, also production technology, has a possibility to, to improve the living of mankind. And there are some people in the world, uh, some kind of game changers, um, who are thinking in a different way about um, value creation, production technology, and they have not the high-end technology in focus, but other things. And this is what you're talking about, mm -hmm. Marcin Jakubowski. I welcome you here in Hamburg. Um, we will have a short uh, presentation, a talk, mm -hmm. 20 minutes, I think, yeah. and then time for discussion. So be prepared, prepared for the yeah. discussion and your questions. Yeah. Uh, this is a very good opportunity to come in contact with you. Yeah. It's yours. Thank you. Okay. So, okay. Can everybody hear me? Is the sound going okay? A couple of things. So I have my notebook here. If you want to get announcements about or keep in contact with me or announcements of future workshops and collaboration opportunities, please do so by filling it out. Just name and email will do. So please pass this on. It's my personal notebook. I was brief, go, brie, briefly going through this and there's, um, I'm glad to see some, some real um, overlap of what we do. Like for example, some things in this, in this fine thing, things that stood out to me. Ultra efficient factory. We talk about micro factories, a model of production with open source hardware tools. Just to put it into perspective, um, another article, methodology for the development of hardware startups. We're into startups. We talk about distributive enterprise, as in open source businesses that where people actually collaborate instead of competing. There's a methodology for the suitability validation of a highly iterative product development approach. That's what we work on all the time. We talk about breaking things down into absolute minimum pieces by modular design and in, in iterating rapidly th using to techniques like Scrum and so forth. So the people who wrote those articles, maybe please get in contact with me perhaps so we can talk about more, more of that and I'll put it into some more perspective. Who has seen my TED talk here so far? Okay, very few people. Let's, let's go really quickly through the four minutes of the TED talk because that's still the best overview to put this, all this work into perspective. So let me just start with that. Just give me four minutes as we do this. It pretty much summarizes what we have done to date. It's back from 2011, but it's still quite relevant in terms of the overall message. So it's, it's a good thing and an inspirational source for this work. Hi, my name is Marcin, farmer, technologist. I was born in Poland, now in the US. I started a group called Open Source Ecology. We've identified the 50 most important machines that we think takes for modern life to exist. Things from tractors, bread ovens, circuit makers. Then we set out to create an open source, DIY, do-it-yourself version that anyone can build and maintain at a fraction of the cost. We call this the Global Village Construction Set. So let me tell you a story. So I finished my 20s with a PhD in fusion energy and I discovered I was useless. I had no practical skills. I mean, the world presented me with options and I took them. I guess you can call it the consumer lifestyle. So I started a farm in Missouri and learned about the economics of farming. I bought a tractor, then it broke. I paid to get it repaired, then it broke again. And pretty soon, I was broke too. I realized that the truly appropriate, low-cost tools that I needed to start a sustainable farm and settlement just didn't exist yet. I needed tools that were robust, modular, highly efficient and optimized, low-cost, made from local and recycled materials, 
that would last a lifetime, not designed for obsolescence. I found that I would have to build them myself. So I did just that. And I tested them. And I found that industrial productivity can be achieved on a small scale. So then I published the 3D designs, schematics, instructional videos, and budgets on a wiki. Then contributors from all over the world began showing up, prototyping new machines during dedicated project visits. So far we have prototyped eight of the 50 machines, and now the project is beginning to grow on its own. We know that open source has succeeded with tools for managing knowledge and creativity, and the same is starting to happen with hardware too. We're focusing on hardware because it is hardware that can change people's lives in such tangible material ways. If we can lower the barriers to farming, building, manufacturing, then we can unleash just massive amounts of human potential. That's not only in the developing world. Our tools are being made for the American farmer, builder, entrepreneur, maker. We've seen lots of excitement from these people who can now start a construction business, parts manufacturing, organic CSA, or just selling power back to the grid. Our goal is a repository of published design so clear, so complete, that a single burned DVD is effectively a civilization starter kit. I've planted 100 trees in a day. I've pressed 5,000 bricks in one day from the dirt beneath my feet and built a tractor in six days. From what I've seen, this is only the beginning. If this idea is truly sound, then the implications are significant. A greater distribution of the means of production, environmentally sound supply chains, and a newly relevant DIY maker culture can hope to transcend artificial scarcity. We're exploring the limits of what we all can do to make a better world with open hardware technology. Thank you. Okay, so that's a, that's a brief overview. Uh, I mentioned the word artificial scarcity. I think about that a lot. It's about making material substances abundant. I want to share a little bit of my background. How are we on time? What's the minute now? Uh, we're like five minutes in or? Okay, Just, I want to time it well. Okay, a little bit about my story. So, by the way, you can follow us, opensourceecology.org. Open Source Ecology, the Facebook was where we post most of the updates. My email is marchin at opensourceecology.org. So I was born in Poland. So um, when I came to this country in 1982, this was the scene that, that greeted me. This was the great times behind the Iron Curtain. This is not a parade. That's, that's the real picture in my city of Poznań. Um, and, for example, my, my grandfather was in a, in a Polish underground derailing the German supply trains at that time. And my grandmother was in a concentration camp. So I th that the story of um, material scarcity or, or like deprivation and, and terrible history of humanity, is, it's in my mind. I think about it a little bit. But then when I came to America in, in 82, things were beautiful. I went to Princeton, ended up with a PhD from University of Wisconsin-Madison, discovered I was useless. And at that time, uh, I started really thinking about what it would mean to make a better society. And the last year of, of, co of the university program, I started open source ecology. And that was particularly because I wasn't able to talk, even in my work in fusion energy, I wasn't able to talk openly about my materials because we had some hot, hot stuff. And I thought about, okay, well, that's a waste. It's competitive waste. What would it look like if we really collaborated openly with one another? So I started the project, which is essentially about integrating the natural and human-made ecosystems into a working harmonious whole. It's a systems approach to creating a, a new operating system for how we produce things, um, how, how we run society to, to attain that material prosperity because you see that one, one country might have nothing and another country is abs absolutely prosperous. Why is that? Um, so I started to explore that. So moved out to a blank piece of land. This is in Maysville, Missouri, in, in the middle of the United States. And 
we, we started to build. And the idea is, if you have rocks, sunlight, plants, soil, and water around, that's all the substance of an advanced civilization that you need. So in the context of an open source microfactory, localized production, uh, we can do very well wherever those resources are available, even any parcel of land. Like the, our experiment is, is about seeing, can we create an advanced civilization just from the energy and material inputs of our site? It's a very exciting proposition. So we st start to prototype different machines that make life easier. Uh, got up to, right now we're, this, so this is the growth in the first few years after the TED Talk, starting with the very first, like the brick press where we needed some housing, so we had to build a brick press so we can build housing. Uh, currently we're about 120 or so prototypes as of 2015, I kind of lost count. There's about a couple of dozen replications around the world as far as the machines in eight countries around the world, but it's far from viral. It's, I mean, it, you have to talk about get to the high quality of the products in order to, for this to spread better and, and develop actual real working products. But we, do, we work on the level of machines, the products of the machines like houses. Um, we publish all the designs openly. We also build things like the Aquapana Greenhouse. And the most recent effort is called the Open Building Institute. Basically, um, a modular building system for houses where you can download and use open source software to design houses of any kind of size and shape, um, including the materials production. So part of the machines that we have produce materials like the block, compressed earth block, like lumber, like um, insulation. So the, the latest project, we haven't done this yet, but we're also producing the materials with which we can build, up to things like polycarbonate multi-wall glazing that's 3D printed. So one of the machines is a 3D printer, let's apply that to things like advanced glazing for the greenhouse, um, and that's a model of the house that we're building. But right now we're about 25% done, um, not far. So I want to talk about the six major milestones. The first one was that people can simply download our plans without even you know, without us knowing even. This guy, for example, was the first replicator of any of our machines. A guy in Texas downloaded the plans and without, without even contacting us, he sent me this, this picture one day and I thought, wow, that looks like a photocop Photoshop copy of my machine. No, it's not. So it's a real replication. They built the machine, pressed some bricks, and so forth. So, so various replications in the United States, power cube, the hydraulic power unit, a tractor built in, by some high school students, tractor built attempt in in Guatemala, a build in Italy, China, uh, Turkey as a model. This is in Texas, where they sent it to Africa. Current production operation in Texas. Perhaps the biggest effort right now, we saw this thing in Nicaragua, where they have what appears two of our brick presses and four power cubes pressing bricks in an operation. Something completely independent from our work. Some of the houses they built. This is quite recent too, a tractor replication in a gold mine in Peru. These guys are going at it digging and, and, and pumping water, things like that. So that's, the, replication can happen just by the virtue that you're publishing your stuff openly. So that's the, that's the name of the game. The second thing is about optimization of the production techniques. We are able to build our, comp, our big heavy machine like the, like the brick press in a single day by using a, a large swarming process. So the brick press, it weighs 1,600 pounds, almost a ton. Um, we break it down into about a dozen different modules, about 12 teams work in parallel so that you can build the parts independently in a parallel working team and then assemble that rapidly so a single day is enough to build the, the mechanics, electronics, hydraulics, all of that. So, and the way we do it is try to make the instructions very, very clear, kind of like IKEA style fabrication diagrams for what we do. Um, this is the team that built it that day. That's the machine. It, the machine can produce 5,000 bricks a day you know, for a small house. It costs about 5,000 in materials. The next competitor that provides a machine that produces as many blocks is about $50,000. So it's significant economic savings. So, so we talk about radical modularity in the, in the way we design things. Things are made from interchangeable parts like the steel tubing, like the hydraulic power units. That's the key. Like we have, first of all, we modularize civilization's machinery, so it's 50 different machines. Each of the 50 machines is broken down into a number of modules, a lot of which are shared. 
and then each module we have like you know a hundred steps or so for developing the the technology so a highly modular process iterative we're trying to figure out how to do that very effectively and doing everything modularly from from the design to the actual build everything in between modular hydraulic power units that can be used to power the tractor the brick press or anything the modular tubing for frames for iron worker uh, metal metal shearing machines like this one um, modular rotors which can be used in an application like like a trencher or the same actually the same uh, same rotor as that is used on the wheels to drive the wheels so really or or drive the the rotor to the tiller the saw pulverizer for the brick press or a giant string trimmer honey extractor uh, so high, highly modular devices like a lego set for things because we're doing this radical modularity we can reduce the prototyping cycle from months to days or weeks to days like for example this iron worker shear machine uh, took us a total of six months to do a lot of machining there's a lot, a lot of complex parts in there here we just redesigned it on the right hand side using our modular techniques we built that in 12 hours with two people and that machine still cut one by 10 inch steel without a problem while holding a seven thousandths blade gap consistently. So you got to get smart about it, redesign for modularity, and it can work. So things like backhoes. Um, we take on a construction set approach. We don't design just one machine, but a construction set for everything. So like for the tractor, we, you can modify it to be a bulldozer or a backhoe or whatever. Um, and that applies to not only the mechanics, but also things like the production tools. Like recently we were building a, a uh, construction set for small CNC machines like 3D printers. Um, that same, the idea here is, for example, for 3D printers, there's only one axis unit here. This, for example, I mean, the Z axis, the X and Y axes are absolutely identical. And you can stack these modules together. You can enlarge them, make larger, larger rods, make them larger. And then you can make anything from a small 3D printer to a CNC torch table. So right now we're re rebuilding the CNC torch table, which is five by 10 feet. So three meters by like two meters or so CNC torch table using these exact same 3D printed items. So, okay. We also achieved the fifth major milestone, which is real-time documentation. So that means at the same time that we build the devices, we have a remote team working. We're uploading pictures through the internet and communicating them on, on Google Hangouts, and we're able to finish, a, finish a, an instructional at the same time that the machine is built, which is very important because most times you lose out on the documentation. Okay, revenue models. What's our revenue model? We, we open up our information, but how do we make money? We can sell the, sell the machines. We do other things like crowdfunding by um, recent campaign. We ended up getting like 116,000 for the Open Building Institute, Open Building Toolkit. I think there's a lot of potential through the X Prize like design challenges where, I don't know if anyone has heard of HeroX.com, but that's a platform where you crowdsource both the reward and the design challenge. So we can crowdfund various things, and that's how we'd like to, we like to do this more because we found that through a process like this, you find a lot of collaborators. We have significant collaboration that just few people, like three or four people, that are now major contributors as, as a result of the crowdfunding campaign. But the thing we're trying to do is uh, we, we do extreme manufacturing workshops. We can build a house, um, house or a greenhouse in five days now using the rapid build techniques, and we're creating immersion learning experiences around that so that people are paying us for the experience as, as training, as well as we can sell the product, like the brick press. We can build it in a single day, we can sell it with $5,000 of profit, and it works. Um, we're gonna come with a 3D printer construction set to Hamburg, Ghent, and Paris, in December, so that's something you can, you can see. If you want to see the parallel build techniques, we're going to do that. We're going to bring that to Europe here, our first workshops abroad. Uh, so yeah, some of the workflows here. You have to really plan out the workflow, how it's going to go in order to achieve the rapid build times. 
things like that. Modularize the components, like these modular roof panels, which are built in parallel on the ground and then assembled rapidly. It's a simple micro house that we expanded and then expanded. That's the inside of it. A lot of open source features like documenting open source hydronic system, like the sto hydronic stove, which will cost you $5,000 in materials, but now we can build it for 500 in materials using an open source design, things like that. So it's a modern, modern day version of the Amish barn raising. That's the kind of the Amish people live in the United States. They do that uh, today still. So we're kind of taking that into the modern age. But our model is to create an organization like Linux, which uh, leverages the, the talents of many contribu contributors using a small organization. Linux gets about a billion dollars worth of contributions in software programming per year. That's very impressive. It's the largest collaborative project on this planet. It's worth replicating for, for the purposes of hardware, open hardware. Um, but this is why we're doing it. So 85 equals 3.5 billion. 85 of the richest people in the world have as much wealth as the 3.5 billion at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, we can fix that by distributing our knowledge so that everyone has access. You lower the barriers to entry to everything, distribute wealth worldwide. That's the deal. Because our genuine progress indicator right now is not, it's not even rising. You know, human condition is not improving while the GDP is growing. So it's about making technology appropriate. The open source microfactory, the, the, literally the manufacturing on a desktop is, when people see that, like the 3D printers, um, that's, that's empowering and, and there's a lot of potential to it. So we, we talk about the open source microfactory that's fueled by, imagine having a total catalog of open source designs for anything from your cars to your CNC machines to energy production equipment, homes and everything that you can um, download and then produce in the local community. And I certainly found it extremely empowering to, to see that after I built the first tractor, it's like, wow, you can do that. There's no mystery to it. If you get involved in that, you, you, can, you start to understand what that's about. And it's about uh, regaining self-determination. Uh, it's about transcending material scarcity from determining the course of human politics. When will we actually pursue those things that are most important and relevant to our happiness and, and prosperity of everyone, as opposed to just having a job or, or making a living? Most people do not get a chance to pursue full-time their passions, and we can, we can be doing that. Uh, we work on hardware because still hardware is very powerful. 80% of the economy is hardware. Um, okay, I'd like to point out this, maybe then I'll just wrap up and go to questions. But open source development is not new. In the first industrial revolution with the steam engine, this is a, a graph that demonstrates the open source method. People always ask, well, the, the industry standard right now is proprietary development. And people think that if you collaborate, you're going to die, essentially. <laughs> it, that's dumbing it down. But people literally think that the entire economic system represents the attitude that if you collaborate, you're going to be punished. But OK, so the guys in the first industrial revolution, after Watt's patent on a steam engine expired, people took that opportunity to, to publish openly and develop the steam engine, which actually, statistically, it was shown that the rate of innovation in terms of steam engine efficiency doubled after Watt's patent. So if you study this case history, you'll see the details. It's not, a, not a, some kind of a freak event, and this is actually about how the role of open innovation played part in that, uh, in that point in history. And the same is true today. Even though Apple and Google spend more on patents than on research and development, that's insane. So we can basically make the world better for everyone, starting with first principles that say there's 10,000 times more power that comes from the sun than we use today in our current economy. So we're not short of resources or power. Uh, it's all there. Uh, but right now, the open source economy effectively does not exist. It's about one ten thousandth of the economy in a hardware world. In a software world, it's way bigger. S open source software has dominated the back ends of the servers. Uh, Wikipedia is open source. There's, open source is very well established in, open, in the software world, where if you don't do open source, you're the weird guy. And the same is going to happen for hardware. We're at the very beginnings of that. 
but there's no, uh, it's, I think it's inevitable that, that that will happen, so we're taking some leadership to make that happen. So anyway, that's, that's about it. I'd like to take a few questions and see where we go from there, but that's an overview of the work we do. Definitely would like to see some collaboration to bring our work to a higher level. It's, it's about developing to, um, the methods that we're developing can apply to anything, like we're showing some, um, a lot of appropriate technology kind of tools, but this can apply to anything, to your advanced CNC fabrication, anything. If we talk about a closed loop material cycle, our idea is a 4,000 square foot, 400 square meter facility where you have everything up to your CNC robotics, as well as an induction furnace where now you can roll your own steel and therefore go from the scrap metal stream to advanced civilization, all within a 4,000 square foot facility. I mean, that's, that's what we're working on. It's definitely feasible. There's no technical limits why that can hap can't happen. It's just a matter of open sourcing that information to make that complex process feasible, primarily because of access to the enabling information that's required to, to make that happen. So anyway, uh, I'll, I'll end up here. Thanks for listening and take, I will take a little few questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you. So, any questions, questions. from anyone in the audience? <laughs> and advanced technology can happen. This man right here is working on an open source MRI machine. Now, that's pretty advanced. The goal is to get it down to a price point of about $10,000 as opposed to a million. <laughs> so, it's a big deal. <laughs> and we're gonna, we'd like to build that on our farm as soon as we can. Any questions? Okay, in many, in many, so, sorry, yeah, it's good. <laughs> I found it very interesting, your ideas. <clears throat> Thank uh, you. I used to work hundreds of years ago uh, in the machine tool uh, business, and <clears throat> when I came as a young engineer into a factory, I said, well, we have to make modules. Mm -hmm. Modules was yeah. very important, as you said. And this company uh, uh, went almost bankrupt by mm -hmm. that. Because yeah. every joint, you have joints in, 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 a, mm -hmm. in a modular uh, system. Yep. Every joint is an economic and a physical weak point. Mm -hmm. Economic, it costs money, and physical, it is a weak point, it's not stiff enough, and mm -hmm. so on. So how is that with your ideas? Yes. Two points to say about that. First of all, if you look at a system's perspective for any point function, you will do better by doing dedicated design. If you're now starting to talk about a system of interchangeability, then it makes more sense. And the second part about that is, um, let's see, the second main point about modularity. If um, the concept of depth of modularity is something we have come up with, you have to create that modularity at the appropriate level. So we can say definitely that in today's society, we can definitely use more modularity. It might not go down to like what we're doing, where even the frame is bolted together. And to give you an example of that, we worked with the, the power cubes, the modular hydraulic units. They were XYZ bolted corners. We found that, yes, it's, it takes more space. It's not as strong, etc. So we start to weld the corners. That's what we'll be doing right now. So you have to select like, at which depth you want to go to the modularity. Yeah. But certainly, I mean, modularity, of course, already exists. You have things like bolts and other things already. So it's about optimizing for the appropriate level of modularity. Yeah. Good question, though, yeah. That's a big one. Yes, uh, if you build, it's really difficult to get up here. You know, see, it's weird to get yeah. used to that. Uh, you build tractors, for instance, uh, different mm -hmm. tractors. And what my question is, what is the, what is industry uh, trying to sell tractors, of course? And so your kind of competitor now, very inexpensive, durable equipment. What do they say? 
What do, do they, they say about this? You? Do they support you? Uh, we haven't run, our products are not well developed yet. We haven't really run into that question because we just pretty much are getting the best, the working prototype right now. We just added tracks, so we have serious traction on the, on the machines right now. But next year we're going to start producing them for sale, is what, what we're looking at. We have gotten them down to a single day build too, so it's a, if you look at Mahindra and Mahindra tractors, which is the largest tractor manufacturer in the world, if you look at the numbers, we can produce, it takes us less labor to, to do our stuff than what they can do, so the efficiency is pretty, pretty much very good and radical. Uh, the other part about the last question about modularity too, the modularity allows a different build process, so we're totally reinventing like, like a house. I mean, who's, who's going to build you a house in five days? Nobody in the world does that. Some people might do that if, if you have factory-made parts, but we're actually building everything on site. So um, with the modular approach, just to wrap up that question, it does bring new economic opportunities about how you produce to take that out of the factory and perhaps like uh, various human, re human resource issues, basically uh, bad factory conditions. You're turning into an education experience as part of the production experience, so it's a little different question. Um, but on the tractor itself, we'll have to see. I, I think the, the idea is that um, if we're offering a better product that costs 10 times less and lasts 10 times longer, I think the industry will notice that and probably will have to adapt some of the methods. Once this gets refined well enough, I think it's inevitable that it will be. There is not really the technical challenges to overcome, uh, in my opinion, from what we've seen so far. So I think the industry will have to notice and, and adapt more of the kind of modularity rapid build techniques. Uh, to give you an, an example, there was, like for example, John Deere, one of our colleagues, uh, John Deere came to them saying, hey, design us a modular combine because the John Deere track uh, combines are too large to fit on the streets of Europe. So, so modular can be attractive for various reasons. Yeah. Okay.